Ministers, executive directors, fantastic, amazing opportunity to be here, to be in this building, <clears throat> to be in Singapore, and to talk to you uh, about uh, different aspects and kind of lenses on the future. Um, as you can see, I couldn't decide which title to use, so I tried three. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, Minister Balakrishnan sort of took us out to the, the galactic level, <laughs> the sort of planetary level. I've covered just about every topic we could cover, an amazing uh, synthesis of all of these issues. I want to kind of bring it way down to a, to a smaller scale, to a human scale. So I thought I would start with a game of uh, what's in my pocket. Um, the picture above is actually what's in my pocket, uh, and it's most of what's in my pocket on a daily basis. Um, typically in these sorts of events we talk about smartphones and we talk about tablets and we talk about all of the sort of amazing um, digital ephemeral uh, artifacts that we have, but very often the artifacts of the future or the artifacts that are interesting indicators of uh, imminent futures are the physical uh, and very often the intimate, the personal. And uh, I carry around a wallet that basically, because I have the privilege of moving in and out of a lot of different countries and cultures and systems, um, I have the, the, uh, the kind of you know, modern traveler's condition of having to carry multiple uh, bits of access and multiple sort of artifacts that let me in and out of different systems around the world. Uh, the objects in your pocket are all from your daily sort of interface with society. So I have in this kind of setting, hopefully I've blurred out most of the numbers and critical information. You don't know my first name, which isn't Scott. Um, uh, they give you keys, you know, keys for access. Uh, my, my faculty ID is up there, uh, keys for access to a building. So this is a system of trust. Different forms of money to buy things um, that are supposed to work worldwide, right? We have global financial institutions, but as a recent immigrant uh, and frequent traveler, I can promise you that's not the case. Uh, we have a standardized systems of smart chips inside smart cards. I've been working on smart card systems <clears throat> since the beginning of my career, about 22, 23 years ago. Some of those initial bits of research that I was doing back in the early 1990s are basically my problem now in my pocket. I have to live with the results of the forecasts that I've made. We have identification, different forms of legibility to the state, to each other, um, to different organizations and groups, things that identify us. My new uh, Dutch residency card that I'm very proud of is up there. It has encoded my biometrics, my, my iris scan, my fingerprints access passes, corporate organizational key cards, transit passes. So each of these are encoded with layers of technology that provide one or many functions, security, traceability, uh, and embedded applications. So you can see there's a lot going on in my pocket. Um, but uh, this, you know, <laughs> there's a lot going on amongst those systems in my pocket. Uh, these cards that are supposed to be my interface to various smart societies uh, are often in conflict with each other, something that um, we call thing clash. Uh, and a project that we're doing at Changest. So the idea that these things don't exactly agree with each other. When I get out my wallet to go through a, a turnstile in a metro system, drama ensues. Um, these systems are designed to help me, but they don't get along with each other necessarily. You can see some of the imagined dialogue amongst them. Um, my bank card is supposed to work with my transit card in the Netherlands and top it up when I run out of money. Uh, more often than not, at least for me as a newbie, um, this is not working the way that it's supposed to. And a lot of panicked dashes to the train station to get my children on the train in the morning happens. Um, my Oyster card in London conflicts with my debit cards and my contactless cards. Um, some of these things get along quite nicely. Uh, we have a new friend, the Singapore Transit card. Uh, we'll get to see how well it actually gets along with the other uh, artifacts as I keep it uh, after my travel. But um, a, lot of, a lot of action happening in here, a lot, sort of a soap opera. And if you've been to London in the past couple of years, you will have seen or heard um, something along these lines. Watch out for card clash. What is card clash? <laughs> If you're new to London and you hear the sort of stern, you know, uh, matriarchal announcement on the tube, please be aware of card clash. You're thinking, what have I done wrong? What am I going to do wrong? You know, you've, you've entered this amazing, beautiful, rich, complex global city uh, with, you know, a, a first of its kind integrated transport system. Uh, contactless cards are able to sort of get you, you know, easily frictionless movement through all of these systems. And the first thing you're greeted with is watch out. So this is a bit of a dichotomy, right? This is a bit of a conflict, a bit of a tension. Uh, we have the promise of frictionless smartness, but we also then have this immediate warning, don't do it wrong. 
something the internet has taught us to do quite well, right? You're doing it wrong. So card clash is essentially where your transit card and your contactless debit card are fighting for the attention of the, tr of the turnstile to, to know which one you can actually use uh, to get entry into the system. It's a complex multi-multi-million dollar or multi-million pound system um, that instead of actually kind of making it a, uh, in a fashion that people uh, can use it, it's uh, designed kind of around and against people. It's kind of imposing itself upon us. So we create workarounds, hacks, fixes, new policies. We have to come up with new names for bad behavior like card clash. Um, this is one of the new industries in creativity, creating terms for things that don't exist yet that you shouldn't be doing, um, some of which the minister referenced earlier. Um, and you know, we have reimbursements that we have to fight for, expenses, communication, all of these things kind of happening back and forth. And so we invent things like a wallet uh, that has a bits of aluminum foil inside tin foil that basically separates these things. All of this, you know, if you combine the sort of expense and the cost and time to develop all of those systems that were represented in my wallet, and here we come with a sheet of thin tin foil to separate these systems. We're effectively making, uh, we're, we, are, we are pushing against the system. We're making space for ourselves. Um, so, uh, of course, this then turns into uh, quite a, a booming industry. Um, you can, you know, get a, a very simple wallet, or this is actually a, a Dutch design company. Since I'm, I'm living there now, I'll support Dutch design. Secure ID that basically makes a nice metal container for you to put your cards in. And it looks very sleek, it's very beautiful. The Wall Street Journal has recently had a feature on the cover showing um, dozens of beautiful, stylish, luxury RFID protection wallets. So it's not just something for the tinfoil hats in the audience to worry about. It's something that actually is something that anyone here at the hotel, uh, um, anyone here in the city might sort of sport a luxury version of. So this is kind of an indicator species, if you will, to borrow a phrase that a friend uses, uh, that points us, a signal pointing us towards the kind of future that we might have. Instructables, the website that gives us information about how to uh, make things that we want on our own has the instructions to construct your own. This sort of Mad Max looking duct tape contraption here uh, is something that a person is you know, creating and sharing the instructions with others so that they might share this ability to push back against the system and to make space for themselves. And of course, maker culture takes that one step forward. People like to prototype. Um, you can essentially melt down. I'm not suggesting this, but you could, if you were that kind of person, somebody else, a friend, could melt down uh, one of these cards, extract the radio technology from inside it, uh, wrap it in Sugru, which is a prototyping uh, and repair uh, substance, is the best way to describe it, uh, kind of rubbery substance. And you can fashion your own um, various kind of keychains anything you like. If you want to sort of use the logo, you can make a beautiful panda. And this sort of becomes not just a way of pushing against the system, but essentially kind of personalizing it and making the system work for you. Um, you can put it on whatever part of your body you'd like to bump against the turnstile and go through. There is someone who has a wand, a magic wand in London that I've heard of, who waves his wand across. <laughs> so when you go home today, maybe you know somebody you'd like to try. Um, so, but this is just one instance. This, this, is, this is kind of my artifact that gets us going. Um, these smart technologies have gone from something that's only sort of dealt with in specialist publications to now, as you can see, we're getting our own kind of DIY instructions. But we're no longer talking about smart as in um, big systems in a city, a transport system, large computing infrastructures. We're talking about smart as basically the furniture in our homes, our own personal accessorization. We have things like Google Glass. We have Apple Watch, you know, that can be anywhere from a few hundred dollars to $15,000, just like the RFID wallets, luxury watches that can do just about anything. We have, uh, you know, furniture that the smart camera here can not only kind of keep track of your children or, you know, let you know if, you're, if your kids have gotten home from school, if you're at work. It also has cry detection. So if someone, presumably your child, is crying in the home, the smart camera will notify you of that. It also can sense the release of certain industrial gases in case there's a fire or um, you know, paint fumes or something like that. We have a smart bed, um, which you know, if you think about long enough, you might sort of think, hey, great, um, maybe not. A smart bed that tracks all of the activity that's going on in it and reports it to uh, a central interface. <laughs> I'll just leave that here. Goodbye. <laughs> So what is smart? It's sleek, it's convenient, it's optimized, but what does that mean for average people? 
So we have this new icon of smart. We're going from the furniture in our homes now to something else. Only a few years ago, we were talking about self-driving vehicles, autonomous cars as something um, you know, in the abstract, something that was happening at MIT or at DARPA, uh, something happening in the laboratory, but, but these things are sort of upon us now. Um, the self-driving car and the autonomous vehicle has taken, it's taken most of a century to establish the social and behavioral and legal norms around powered mobility, around driving. If you think about the history of the 20th century, particularly in developed countries, um, the, the cities are shaped by the functions of the vehicles. And now we have this massive step change upon us where uh, the vehicles will actually be able to move themselves. And, you know, as we're beginning to introduce these things onto the road, of course, strange and unexpected things happen. Uh, you know, they go through a tremendous amount of testing. The previous slide, you could see the way that they see the road through LIDAR and infrared technologies to sense the objects, the movements uh, of pedestrians, cyclists, other cars. Recently, there was a story that emerged from testing of the Google self-driving car in Austin, Texas, where the car approached on the public street an intersection, and a cyclist approached from the other direction. And if any of you ride fixed gear bikes, uh, you'll, you'll, and you're a pro at this, I'm certainly not, um, you'll know what a track stand is. A track stand is where you approach a stopping point and use your body weight and balance to essentially not put your feet on the ground and show what an awesome person you are. Uh, but you hold your position at the intersection. The car approached, the cyclist approached, the car moved forward, the cyclist wobbled, the car stopped. The cyclist moved, the car moved again, the cyclist moved, the car stopped. Apparently for two minutes, the bike and the car were stuck at the intersection, sensing each other, a human versus a machine, the machine not really knowing what was happening next and just wouldn't leave the intersection. Um, these are the kinds of things that happen when we introduce these smart systems occasionally into public life. I'm not saying this is sort of a sweeping generalization that it's all like this, but um, we develop these technologies often in the abstract and in a kind of vacuum and then introduce them into human systems where the, it pre-existed culture. Um, and we have to then kind of tweak the technology to adapt to this. On Thursday morning, I woke up and I had the new version of Android downloaded to my phone. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones that gets kind of the early release of the operating system. It seems safe so far if you're on Android. But at the same time, Tesla S drivers were waking up to find that they had a notification that their new autopilot function had been downloaded or was available for download to their cars. The new autopilot function was available for download to your car. Just let that hang in the air for a moment. This is a significant, significant sort of step change in the way that we think about technology in the city, the way that we interact with each other. We now have very large, very expensive autonomous machines um, that we will have to adapt our behavior to move around. This is something that Alexis Lloyd, uh, who's a, a colleague and you know, brilliant um, designer and writer and thinker at the New York Times R&D Lab calls compliance. The idea that we have to, as people, uh, adapt our long-run behaviors around new emerging technologies. In some cases, being able to speak in a way that a voice recognition system can understand, or it may be figuring out how to approach a car at an intersection and decide, is it real? Is it driven? Is, there, is a robot riding this? And we have to learn how to say things differently, pronounce names so that voice recognition systems can understand them, like Lesta Square. Um, and this, this culture of adaptation uh, ends up kind of bending us to the system instead of the system to us. So this has been our companion for the week as we went from the hotel to the NDC. Bet one, thank you very much. Um, this is the kind of messaging we encounter in daily life. It probably means a lot more to people who are, are local to Singapore, but I look at it and approach it and think, I'm, this, this is giving me permission to do a lot of things, but I'm not sure how or what. <laughs> so even just the sort of simple act of driving forward through an intersection you know, gives us these kinds of challenges. And I think the sort of thought that I want to come back to is that uh, to be a smart nation and to develop these sorts of systems and to make them useful and to make them valuable in the world around us. We have to recognize what came before it. If you're a programmer, you'll know what an API is, but for those of you who aren't, it's an application programming interface. It's essentially where one piece of code speaks to another. Culture, of course, is the oldest code we have. 
Some of our behaviors will change. We will always adapt to new technologies. We will always learn new and different ways to do things. But I think it's important as well in the, con in the conception of these systems to take into account um, the, the sort of time-honored or deep social and cultural behaviors that we have. And that culture can be the API that these smart systems are actually written to interface with. The things that we know, the things that we are, the things that we treasure ourselves, the things that we value. So when we're thinking about smart, we have to understand that when we implement smart things now, we're actually encoding, we're encoding things for future generations, not just ourselves. It's not just something that we can kind of shake off with a, a new release, but this is something that we'll have to live with, and it's something our children will have to live with. These systems will be with us not through the good times, but also the bad times. These systems will be with us at the end of our lives. And we need to actually build them in ways that, re that recognize that and do for us what we need to have done. We want to acknowledge tradition. For example, the way that, that we've learned to drive around a city or move around a, a metro system or communicate with each other. They need to recognize individuality. Uh, as Minister Balakrishnan talked about, sort of the individualization of blue jeans or 3D printing. That's one sort of side of it, but they need to recognize that we're all different, that we have different needs around privacy, recognition, identity, all of these things that sort of come from us as individuals. They need to, to enact our values, not the other way around. We shouldn't be enacting the values of technology. They should represent us. And this is a big task. This is really, really hard. This is why technologists and sociologists and anthropologists should be working hand in hand through the development of these systems. And they need to support our agency. They need to sort of enable us to do the things that we need and want to do, not put us in a box. So, just to end, we had a fantastic week starting a week ago today, working in the Innovation Lab of Future Everything, where uh, we had six lead designers come into prototype. Uh, we had 30 plus brilliant artists, designers, technologists, some of whom are in the audience, come in and give their time and their energy and their knowledge and their experience to creating prototypes that represent this kind of human-centered future. Um, as many companies and countries around the world are learning, um, progress cannot be encoded. For a, a nation to truly grow and to thrive and, to, and to, to aspire, that can't be delivered solely through technology and solely through um, encoded values. It needs to be delivered by technology that supports the capabilities, which are quite infinite, of the individual people who live there. Progress comes from people, and we need to make space for people as we move into that future. Thank you.